Hi, I decided to do an algebra review for you guys as well, and you can see that this uh, video lesson is going to cover five different things. Exponent rules, completing the square, factoring patterns, simplifying rational expressions and equations, and a little bit with logs. So feel free to skip around if there's a part of this that you want to see and you don't need to see the rest, that's of course fine. Exponent rules. Two things that come up a lot in calculus are negative exponents, and so it in the example that I have here, x to the negative fourth is 1 over x to the fourth, and x to the one third is the cube root of x to the first. So in these examples, if you tried to generalize, you would know that x to the negative n is equal to 1 over x to the n, and that implies that if you already have a negative exponent, but it's already in a denominator, then it actually just comes up to the numerator, okay? So I sometimes will say in my algebra classes that a negative exponent causes something to switch levels, so to speak, upstairs and downstairs being the levels of a, fra um, a fractional expression. So this is what we would say for things with negative exponents. And then this guy here, I um, say in my algebra classes when I teach freshmen that you need to remember that a root is in the bottom, just like if you have a tree, right? The roots are at the bottom of the tree. So the same sort of thing is true here with roots, with mathematical roots. So if we have the nth root of x to the a, let's say, that's x to the a over n as the exponent. Okay, so that's just a little reminder. Those things do come up in calculus a fair bit. Um, another topic I wanted to review with you is the idea of solving with completing the square. And so here are two examples. One's a little easier than the other, and your algebra teacher might um, have done this slightly different than I'm about to do. So if you know a different way that gets you the same end result, of course you have my blessing to do that. Um, I teach this in algebra um, as you need to move the constant term over as your first step. Second step is to see what this um, number is right here. If it's a 1, then you don't have the step that I'm referring to right now. We'll see that in the next problem. Um, if it is a 1, then you can just proceed on to step number 3. Step number 3 is actually completing the square, which is where you take half of this middle term and square it. So we take half of the 4, the coefficient part only. So half of 4 is 2, and 2 squared is 4. So we're going to add 4 to each side of the equation, keeping the equation in balance. And now this side, by design, will be something that factors to something to the second power. It's a perfect square. So that's um, what we gained in our procedure here. So we'd have x plus 2, quantity squared equals 5. And now the advantage of having this format is that it's an easy one to solve. We take the square root of both sides. And we subtract it. Now this is the exact same. I'm so sorry for my handwriting being so awful on this. This um, computer is new to me. Um, what I was I was saying is you'd get this same format of answer if you use the quadratic formula. Okay, and so this is just a way to get around the quadratic formula. It is a little bit um, faster, I believe, if you're good at it. Okay, this other one. Um, is my example to show you what is different when you don't have a 1 in the front as your leading coefficient. So here we go like that, and then we look at that leading coefficient, we say, oh shoot, it's not a 1, so we have to factor it out. Now, it is not taking out the greatest common factor. The greatest common factor on the left side of the equation is 2x. That's not what we're factoring out. We're going to factor out that 4. No matter what this number is right here, that is the number we would pull out, okay? And then we'd have everything else over here. This is going to actually be a fraction. If I take 4 and um, divide 4 out of 2, I'm left with a half as the result. And I'm leaving this space right here because this is where I'm going to complete the square. I'm going to use the rule we did previously and take half of the middle terms, coefficient, and squared. So half of a half is a fourth, and a fourth squared is a sixteenth. Now, even though my pen right there wrote 1 16th, that 1 16th is actually influenced by the 4. So I actually added 4 16ths, which is a 4. And now I'm going to just simplify this up by factoring on the left side. So I have x plus 1 fourth quantity squared for the um, trinomial part. And over here, I'll just tidy up. So I have negative 3 4 
fours. And then I am going to solve. So I multiply both sides by this four. So now, um, actually I take that back. I divide both sides by four to get rid of that four. I apologize. I must break there. So this, oops. So this side would be negative three sixteenths. And now when I take a square root, I'm actually going to end up with a complex number because of the negative on the right side. So I square root both sides to get rid of this square. And I'd have positive or negative square root of negative 3 sixteenths. As I mentioned, the negative is going to give me an i. Radical 3 is nothing I can simplify, but radical 16 is the number 4. And then I would have x plus 1 fourth on this side, so I would move that 1 fourth over by subtracting 1 fourth from both sides. So um, that is definitely a harder problem. You could get this answer again by using quadratic formula. Definitely quadratic formula can give you complex answers at times. All right, these are some factoring problems. Every time we factor, we want to ask ourselves if there is a greatest common factor. And in this problem that we're looking at here, there is. You could take out a 4. And then your remaining terms would be 8c to the third minus 27 d to the third. Oh, I'm horrible at writing on this. I apologize all over the place. I'm really, my handwriting is much better um, on something else. <laughs> okay, this now is a difference of cubes. And you might have learned this using the word soap. Before we worry about that, though, let's um, figure out what the terms are. So this first set of parentheses is two terms, and the second set of parentheses is three terms. You take the cube root of each of these terms. So this would be 2c, and this would be 3d, okay? And then for the terms in the trinomial part, you're going to square this. So that would be 4c to the second. Ay, ay, ay. It's just when I write small, I think. Ay, horrible. And 3d squared is going to be 9, oh, I almost wrote that wrong, 9d to the second. And then we multiply these two together to get the middle. So that would be 6cd. And then we think about that word soap. Soap is to help you remember the signs. So this is a minus, so this is going to be the same as that. This is going to be opposite that. And this is always positive. Same, opposite, always positive. And that goes with a sum or a difference of cubes. The next example, I'm going to use grouping. And a hint for um, recognizing that I might want to use grouping is having four terms. That's not to say that every time you have four terms you use grouping. It's just that it's a technique you can use with four terms. It may or may not work. In this case, it does. So in, out of the first group, I can pull out the greatest common factor of 8y to the second. Ooh, better exponent for my handwriting. Ay, ay, ay. Inside here, we would have the rest of what would be left over if I pull out that factor. So I'd have a y from this term. And then from this term, we just have plus 3. Now, if grouping is going to work, this second part better have a y plus 3 in parentheses. Can you think of something I could pull out of those two terms that would leave me with y plus 3? If you said minus 7, you are correct. And then I think of this as a term, and I think of this as a term. And both of those terms have y plus 3 in common, so that's a greatest common factor. And my leftovers would be 8y to the second minus 7 killing me. Okay, I clearly did not do my homework over the summer because I should have practiced with this tablet more. Thanks for bearing with me. Okay, this next example is sort of like a quadratic or a, um, a trinomial. Um, the way that we, let me say it this way, the way that we would factor this is the same way we would factor a trinomial that had an x squared. It's just that instead of x squared, we have x to the fourth. So we are going to break this down as like backwards um, foil if you call things FOIL, um, we'd have an x squared times an x squared to get the x to the fourth. And then in back, negative 9 and negative 4 multiply to equal 36. And then this part, along with this part, would combine to give you the negative 13x to the second. So I look at this now and I say, oh, I can factor further because both of these terms are difference of squares, right? This is a difference of squares and this is a difference of squares. So I'd have x plus 
plus 3, x minus 3, and then x plus 2, and x minus 2. And that would be my completely factored form. Um, the next one, I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, the factoring on this isn't really the thing that is super interesting. It's that this problem has an equation to it. It's not an expression. The other factoring problems that I did with you all were expressions where you just factored. The whole reason that we would learn to factor something like this into little pieces is so we can solve. That is kind of the big point of algebra is to be able to solve problems, solve equations. So we have something like this set equal to zero. If I am multiplying two things and I get a result of zero, that means that one of the things has to be zero itself. Right? If you have two positive numbers multiplied together, you're not going to get zero. If you have two negatives multiplied together, you're not going to get zero. If you have one of each, you're not going to get zero. The only way to get a zero as an answer to a multiplication problem is if one of the two things that you're multiplying together is zero, right? So if this is a zero over here, either this or this has to be a zero. So that's what I just wrote in blue over here. And then that allows us to solve, which as I said is a huge point of math, right? I don't know what this one is. Like. Okay, so the two solutions for that would be two and a half and three, okay? Um, cruising right along. This next part is about rational expressions and equations. And so this problem uses factoring. And I'm going to go a little fast because I want to make sure I get in underneath my 15 minute time limit on this software that I'm using. Um, so I would start out like this and I would factor. So here I'd have x plus 3, or excuse me, x plus 5 and x minus 3. And over here, I'd have x plus 5 and x minus 4. Now, in order to subtract things that are fractions, I have to have a common denominator. So I'm going to need to put an x minus 4 with this first term. And I need to multiply by x minus 4 over itself, because I can't just multiply by random things. That would change the problem. But I can multiply by things that are equivalent to 1. So on the second fraction, I'll multiply by x minus 3 over x minus 3. This purple fraction is equal to 1, but it's going to change it so this entire problem has the same denominator, which is this. And then up top, I would foil this out and I would distribute this x and I'd remember that there's a minus sign there. And so what I'd end up with on top is 2x squared minus 8x plus an x, that's an 8 back here, um, minus 4, and then minus x squared, and minus a minus would be plus, so plus 3x. And then I would tidy up the top by combining like terms. Okay, so there's like one more step here that I'm just going to gloss over a little bit. I think you get x squared um, minus 4x minus 4, and then the same denominator with the three things. Okay? So that's just a quick reminder of something from chapter 6 in good old advanced algebra freshman year. Here, this is a proportion. And so every any time you have two fractions equal to each other, you can do what is called cross multiplication. And then here we would get that negative x equals negative 15, and so x equals 15. Okay? And then the last thing I wanted to talk about real quickly has to do with logarithms. Okay, I'm going to pause this for a second just to save a little time. Okay, so these are some log properties. Multiplication turns to addition, division turns to subtraction, exponents come down in front. We can use these in problems like the following. This first one you rewrite into exponential notation and solve from there. The second one you um, use the log properties I mentioned, so addition becomes multiplication, and then we'd say 2 to the second, which is 4, so 4 equals x squared plus 3x, is how we would proceed. Um, the last few, you would rewrite this part as a power of 5, and then 2x minus 3 would equal 4, solve from there. And in the last one, you would move the 7 over, and then take the base 10 log of both sides. This part is a decimal from your calculator, and then you subtract 5 to both sides, and you have your solution. I know that last part was rushed, but take a look at the problems and ask me if you need um, any help. Thanks a lot.